I now found myself at Grantham for my advanced training on Hawker Hearts and Hawker Hinds. Uh, we were now in our Royal Air Force uniforms but not yet allowed to wear wings on our left breasts. These would be awarded on satisfactory completion of this three months flying training and interim examinations. It was about the halfway stage that many fell by the wayside suffered the dreadful humiliation of being told that they weren't good enough and silently had to pack their bags. These dismissals really concentrated the mind on the job in hand and obviously served a useful purpose. The final hurdle was a lengthy, lengthy flying test wherein you had to perform closely observed aerobatics, forced landings, blind flying on instruments, night flying and landing, uh, and precise navigation. I was passed out by Lord David Douglas Hamilton, the Chief Flying Instructor. I now had my wings, my Civil Aviation Pilot's License, number 20039, and a commission warrant, properly signed by His Majesty King George, and I was posted to operational flying. Between 1940 and 45, I served with various squadrons and specialist units. 151 Hurricane Night Fighter Squadron, based at Gravesend, where we were billeted in Lord Darnley's historic residence. 264 Defiant Night Fighter Squadron, based at Rochford in South End. Then Marshalsham Heath and later Curtin Lindsay. Then 24 VIP Communication Squadron, based at Hendon. 56 Hurricane and Typhoon Squadron, based at Northweald and Duxford. 55 OTU Hurricane Tactics Instructor, based at Annan in Dumfrieshire. A specialist low attack unit, based at Millfield, where we were engaged on secret experimental firing with rockets and 40mm cannons. 154 Spitfire Squadron, based at Coltishall and Duxford WA-1 Satellite. And finally, as Flight Lieutenant to 181 Typhoon Ground Attack Squadron, commanded by Squadron Leader Crowley Milling. I made my last operational flight with 181 Squadron, which was a daylight dive bombing attack on Abville Aerodrome, with eight Typhoons. At that time, Abville was being used as a forward fighter base by the Luftwaffe. I also remember I had engine trouble, and... Uh, I was kind of had to come home all on my own without the comfort of the rest of the squadron in escort. By now I had completed nearly a thousand hours flying with these various units. Most of my operational flying was with, with 56 Hurricane Squadron and on sweeps and escorts with 12 Group Wing flying from forward bases of Red Hill and Manston. And this 12 Group Wing was led by either Wing Commander Beamish or Stanford Tuck. 56 Squadron was led by Squadron Leader Peter Hanks with myself as A Flight Commander and Mike Inglefinch as B Flight Commander. It was Mike and I who flew to Brockworth Aerodrome in Gloucester to collect the first typhoons for operational service when the squadron parted company with, it, with our Hurricanes. My detachment to 24 VIP Communication Squadron at Hendon was an interesting period for me. It was here that I had my first dual instruction on big twin-engine planes by three very experienced pilots, Baker, Vesey and Blenner has it. I believe two of these were old Imperial Airways pilots. The two planes mainly in use were the Flamingo and the Lockheed Electra. They were used entirely for flying VIPs around the British Isles and the mail to Northern Ireland. I was able to enter many famous names in my logbook. Anthony Eden, Francis Day, Lord Gort, Sir John Dill, General Alexander, General Sikorsky and a host of others. We often flew in extremely difficult and sometimes dangerous weather but always with unswerving accuracy and confidence. I recall very heavy icing on the leading edge of an Electra's wings when we were on our way to Perth Aerodrome with the Polish General Sikorsky. The de-icing pulsator failed to dislodge the heavy build-up of ice on the port wing and Mr Baker had to struggle to keep control of the plane 
during the tense blind landing approach. I so well remember the faint smile on his face as we finally came to a standstill at the end of the runway in a blinding snowstorm. It was a masterly bit of flying by a real expert. It's a sad fact that my precious flying logbook was lost later on when I was in transit to Germany, wherein all these precious details of operational flights and those marvellous names were recorded. I had always hoped that it might turn up one day, but 50 odd years is a long time, but I don't think so now. I must now mention the tragic death of my younger brother Dick, who was killed on the Dieppe raid in a twin engine Blenheim. It was a sad waste, this raid has been described as an incompetent blunder, and is mentioned in the book on the life and command of Lord Mountbatten. At the time of this incident, I received a message from an old family friend, Bill Ginn, to say that my father was very ill. I made a quick journey home on emergency leave. On arrival at Beanside, I entered the drawing room to find a coffin draped in a Union Jack with four airmen in full dress in attendance. As you can imagine, this was a considerable shock. I had not had any notification of his death or that the funeral was to be at Beanside the Bramfield Cemetery and that very morning. My elderly parents were in a very distressed state indeed. They have, of course, been notified officially of his death and the intended formalities. In their unhappy and bewildered state, they had not unreasonably assumed that I had been made aware also. In fact, I probably would not have known anything for some considerable time after the funeral as it had not been, if it had been for Bill Ginn's message about my father's indisposition. The whole thing made me rather angry. On my return to Duxford, I had an interview with the station commander, Group Captain John Grandy. Not long after this, my operational flying duties were ended, and I was posted to the police school at Wheaton in Lancashire. After a brief and intensive course, which included a very interesting and informative spell, at the Forensic Science Laboratory at Wakefield, I was instructed to report to an address in Baker Street in London. After a lengthy residential briefing at Baker Street, I was seconded to the Counterintelligence Service for special duties overseas. I was given a pink counterintelligence pass, number 2502, signed by Brigadier E. Williams and issued by GSIB Rhine Army. I was then promoted to squadron leader and instructed to report to a wing commander Stonard in Brussels for further instructions. Well, before leaving Baker Street, an incident retains its clarity to this very day. I was walking to the Baker Street address when a flying bomb, or doodlebug as they were flippantly known, flew low towards me, cut its engine and dived as if it was going to fall exactly where I stood. I dived below a very substantial low wall which ran alongside the pavement, fortunately choosing the right side. I covered my ears with both hands and the impact, which was less than a hundred yards away, lifted my body several inches off the ground. Everything seemed to happen in slow motion because I had time to recall my father's experience with the Zeppelin bomb. It was bloody unpleasant and it didn't endear me to the Fuhrer. I got to my feet feeling a bit deaf and dizzy. After a dust hour, I went on my way. Anyway, I now proceeded to Brussels via Eindhoven, stopping for a few days at Eindhoven, which was in an electric mood following the return of their Queen Wilhelmina. I had been a refugee guest of our royal family. Before I left Eindhoven, I witnessed some sorry sights of revenge to unhappy women with their heads completely shaved as public humiliation for cooperation with the Germans, and a half-naked man carrying his own coffin, in which I later understood he was to be buried by the volatile mob who was escorting him. It all seemed so unreal and barbaric, though I realised the Dutch had suffered severely under German occupation. I was glad to move on and made good time to Brussels with my new credentials. I was now informed that I was to be responsible for the life and safety of the new Commander-in-Chief, Sir Arthur Cunningham, and his party. This comprised a squadron leader ADC, and a curious little man 
Mr. Rayburn Dobson, whom I first understood to be some form of diarist or war correspondent. I was to escort this party some hundreds of miles into Germany to, to a new Royal Air Force headquarters at a place called Bad Eilson, and to sign the entire route with small blue arrows so others could follow in due course. Well, I eventually left Brussels with a small band of ten well-armed and resolute men, and an excellent interpreter who spoke four languages, including Russian. We travelled in close convoy, just ahead of the commander in chief, very aware of dangers from snipers and Hitler youth, the latter having a nasty habit of stringing taut piano steel wire across the road at an angle to decapitate unwary dispatch riders or even the occupants of jeeps if the jeep wasn't equipped with a vertical cutter bar welded to the front bumper. As I had four dispatch riders on Harley Davidson's in my party, this was obviously a matter of some concern to me. Mines were not so much of a worry, as uh, I knew the roads were tarmac the whole way, and everyone was aware of the danger of roadside verges or enticing looking pathways. It was obvious that there had been some withdrawal skirmishing along the way. As it was obvious that uh, there had been some withdrawal skirmishing along the way, as the occasional tin hat on an impaled rifle testified. We reached the village of Sukteln without incident, where we remained for a few days. Uh, during this time, I sent a small a party ahead to establish security over the remainder of the route and into Bad Alsen itself. Well, we eventually proceeded to Bad Alsen and took official possession of the magnificent Spa Hotel uh, which from now on was to be the main headquarters second tactical air force under the command of Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Cunningham. Well, I placed armed police on point duty, covering all roads in and out, and established an internal security desk and corridor patrols. Uh, all points were manned day and night with routine contact orders and had direct access to me. I had requisitioned my own strategic headquarters and now had backup reinforcements. The whole area was screwed down as tight as a drum. Within a very short time, things had settled down to an orderly routine, and I was able to travel and attend to other matters. I was slightly curious about Mr. Rayburn Dobson, whom I'm invited over for a chat and a drink. He did a completely unsolicited charcoal sketch of me while we chatted, which I still have. He was obviously a very competent artist. He also seemed to be something of an expert on art treasures. Well, it was shortly after this that we had a new Commander-in-Chief, Sir Sholto Douglas, Marshal of the Royal Air Force. I was now promoted to Wing Commander, Staff Officer Counterintelligence, covering all Royal Air Force installations in the Second Tactical Air Force Command. In May 1945, the Russians moved into Berlin and Germany surrendered unconditionally. I was sitting in my office when the signal arrived at my desk. This same signal was eventually sent by me to the Imperial War Museum, where it still reposes. A strange aura of what I can only describe as depression now seemed to permeate everything. Perhaps more weariness was the right word. It seemed to me that people's minds were no longer fully concentrated on their work. And I suppose why should it be the job was finished and people wanted to think about other things and their futures? Well, I'd recently applied for a permanent commission at the suggestion of my superiors, but uh, it was not long before I had a depressingly negative reply, offering me a temporary extended service appointment, which was not what I asked for or wanted. Well, I now felt I had done my best with five years of highs and lows and some fairly severe responsibilities. In recent weeks, I'd attended the Nuremberg trials visited the shattered wreckage of Hamburg and Berlin, seen the inside of Belsen and the shell of Cologne Cathedral, and perhaps not surprisingly joined the ranks of all those who long for normality, in my case a walk along the river bank.